Welcome to the Real Talk Podcast, where we create conversation and community among real people about everyday issues. This is a place for you to hear truth, connect with others, and find answers to your questions. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Talk. Today you are in for a big treat. Pastor West will be interviewing uh, the president of the International Mission Board, Dr. Paul Chitwood. As always, if you enjoy our content, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, or follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. And also, if you think today's content will benefit or be a blessing to someone, don't hesitate to share it with them. We appreciate your partnership and we hope you enjoy today's show. Well, thanks for joining us uh, today on Real Talk. Alan, appreciate you uh, allowing us to continue this theme on missions uh, that we've, we've started. We're anticipating our, our Global Impact Celebration here in just a few days now, and uh, we thought it would be a great opportunity for us to get to know just a little bit better our, uh, our keynote speaker for our Wednesday night celebration, Dr. Paul Chitwood, who is the president of the International Mission Board. I've had the opportunity to, to go on a couple of hunting trips and spend a little bit of time uh, as his chauffeur uh, a time or two uh, in, uh, in, at some events. And, and Paul's a great guy. And uh, I really wanted you to hear his testimony of how uh, a young boy growing up in the, uh, the foothills of Tennessee and on the border of Kentucky and how he got from where he was to where he is today as president of the International Mission Board. And I think getting to know him a little bit better uh, will, will make uh, what he has to share with us Wednesday night even more powerful, more personal to us. So, Paul, let me welcome you. Thank you so much. I know you're so busy uh, you're traveling the world, and uh, you're in much demand. And I thank you so much for carving out just a few minutes uh, for us, for uh, our podcast. And, uh, and let's just kind of get started by... Maybe uh, you telling us a little bit, of, uh, maybe about yourself, just kind of your family in general, and then I'd like for us to back up a little bit and really start at the beginning of what it was like growing up and just how the Lord used the, the church there in that town to uh, really reach your family, and just a, just a great story of the, of the goodness of God, the grace of God, and, and what He's done in your life. So, so why don't you just tell us just a little bit about yourself and uh, about your, your family, and then we'll, we'll back up and, and talk about the, your, your roots and your beginning. Very good. Well, uh, first, thank you, Pastor West, for having me on today, and thanks for having me uh, at uh, the church. Really looking forward to the Wednesday night that we'll be together. I'll get to meet your church family. I've been incredibly grateful and, and blessed as I've got to know you over the last few years, and certainly thank you for serving on our trustee board. You're a blessing in that way. Uh, very gifted and, and, and wise leader, but also the generosity of your church in supporting uh, mission work and being a part of what God is doing among the nations uh, through the International Mission Board uh, and as, as your church family gives, but also as you go and as you send, uh, it's just been a blessing. So it's, it's a privilege for me uh, to be with you in person soon, but also to be on the podcast today. I wish my family was coming with me uh, because of uh, school and mommy obligations. Uh, that's not going to be happening. But uh, my wife, Michelle, and I have been married 28 years. Uh, we started our courtship at a little uh, elementary middle school. Uh, I think it was a K-8 to school uh, in the little town of Jellicoe, Tennessee, around that Tennessee, Kentucky line over in the mountains. And, and uh, we were in about the eighth grade, uh, 13, 14 years of age. We, did, we didn't marry at that age, even though we're from the mountains. Uh, we waited a little bit. Uh, but uh, both of our, uh, our grandmothers, uh, who grew up in the same mining camp, uh, had married by about that age of life. That's the way life used to be back in the mountains. But, but Michelle and I have been blessed uh, to kind of grow up together and now be to, uh, together and, and uh, marriage for 28 years. We have four children. Uh, our son, Daniel, is 25, lives in Okeechobee, Florida, where he's a, a, a gamekeeper on a private hunting ranch there. We have a daughter, a 23-year-old daughter in Louisville, Kentucky. Our daughter, Anna, uh, is a, an ICU nurse uh, in, in Louisville. And then uh, two younger daughters, both of them we adopted into our family. Our daughter, Kai, is 15. She's a sophomore in high school. And uh, our daughter, Lily, 
uh, is nine and she's a fourth grader. And so because they're in school and I'll be uh, out with you in Arkansas, uh, Michelle won't be traveling with me, but uh, again, just blessed to have uh, the family that we have and also the, the denominational family that allows us to make connections like these. Well, thanks, uh, Paul, for introducing yourself. Let, let's uh, let's go back to uh, kind of your start and your beginning in that Jellicoe, Tennessee uh, area, and tell us a little bit what it was like uh, growing up there uh, in your family, and uh, just the the story of of really how the church there uh, reached out to you guys and how you, you came to know Christ, and just uh, tell us a little bit about those early years. We are, uh, my story is evidence that God can find you anywhere. Uh, it's evidence of God's grace uh, in uh, uh, in the life of uh, of uh, one who doesn't deserve it, and and the journey from where I was to where I am now has just been totally uh, of His kindness uh, to me and and to our family. Uh, I was two years old uh, when our mother left our family. Uh, I had a brother who was age four and a younger brother who was age one at the time. So, uh, our, you know, my childhood is kind of marked in that way. Uh, we were, uh, you know, three kids under the age of five, three preschoolers. Uh, and uh, my father, uh, who had grown up uh, in the mountains, uh, he was the son of a, of a coal miner uh, and uh, his dad was uh, disabled. Uh, my grandpa was disabled kind of early in life working in the mines. Uh, my grandmother, his mother worked in a shirt factory and so they grew up in very uh, uh, humble means uh, you can say. Um, but uh, right out of high school he began working for a telephone company uh, climbing poles. Ended up 45 years later retiring uh, from Bell South. Uh, I continue to work with the company but after his marriage fell apart uh, he moved back in with his parents who were working full time and needed help with three little kids. And, and uh, they had moved out of the mountains down into the projects, the government projects, and little, the little mining town of Jellicoe. Uh, and uh, about a year there with them, he got back on his feet financially enough to rent a house. Uh, and uh, we moved into a little rental house and then over to another rental house. And, and uh, then uh, something uh, very unique uh, happened, uh, at least for our family, uh, not unique in terms of what the church does, but it was unique in our family uh, to have someone knock on our door one evening. Uh, and it was a couple of deacons from the little Baptist church there in town. Uh, and they were out because uh, it was church visitation night out inviting people to come to church. And uh, they made their way up to uh, the little rental house we were living in at 210 Province Street. Uh, it's the next last house on the road before the uh, road gets so uh, steep going up the mountain, you can't build houses anymore. But they climbed the hill, and it was a pretty good hill, uh, and uh, knocked on their door. Dad answered the door. Uh, I guess he was in his late 20s at the time. Uh, right about then, I would have been four, uh, and my younger brother three, my older brother six. And they extended an invitation to Dad uh, to come to church. I don't know if they knew about his circumstances. It was a small town, about 2,000 in the town. They may have known uh, that he was recently divorced. He was raising uh, three boys on his own. Um, what they did know was enough, though. They knew their neighbors needed the Lord. People not in church needed to be invited to church. And, mm -hmm. and the broken families uh, needed, uh, needed the opportunity for hope and for healing. And so knowing what they knew, uh, they made it up to our house and knocked on the door. There's no way they could have known uh, Pastor West, that, that the four-year-old in the house would someday be the president of the International Mission Board. <laughs> I just no way they could have known that, but they knew enough to know that uh, it was a good thing to knock on the door that night and to invite the family in there to church. And uh, Dad accepted their invitation the next Sunday. He got three rowdy little boys ready somehow, and and they got us to church. You know, uh, we, 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 we think about single moms uh, getting kids to church all the time, what a task that is. Uh, I'm not sure how a single dad pulls that off. <laughs> and the mom seemed to be more gifted at, yeah. at wrangling and growling the kids, but but somehow dad did it, and he did it the next Sunday and the Sunday after yeah. that. And we found uh, we found a church family there, uh, much like the church that, that you pastor, a church family that welcomed us in, uh, that loved us, uh, shared the gospel with us. Looking back on it, really helped our family to heal. 
and uh, and helped raise us. Uh, frankly, as as I look back on it now, would later be ordained to ministry in that church, uh, certainly baptized in that church, married in that church, uh, just a little church about a hundred uh, there in town, right on the state line. How grateful I am for uh, for those Baptist deacons who care enough about their neighbors to invite them to church. Um, it was a few years later when uh, we got another knock on the door, and this time it was our pastor. And my older brother had been asked a question about the gospel, and Brother Allen came to, to uh, uh, answer some of those questions. Dad had asked him, but could you stop by some evening and talk to my boy? And so uh, Dad brought a, a chair out of the kitchen, and he set it in front of the green chair in the living room, and Brother Allen sat in the green chair. My older brother was sitting in that kitchen chair, uh, my younger brother and I, we sat uh, in the floor and we listened in as Brother Allen uh, presented the gospel. And uh, Brother Allen got three for one that night uh, as we all committed our lives to the Lord. We're baptized together just a few weeks later uh, in uh, First Baptist Church uh, there in Jellico. Uh, and again, just thankful again for uh, men like yourself, uh, Wes, who, who love the lost, who love the church, uh, who want to see people hear the gospel and see people saved. And, and uh, our pastor, who was that kind of pastor, uh, willing to give up an evening and, and come sitting, uh, sit down in our living room and share the gospel with my brothers and me. And I just look back on all of that and realize uh, that it was of the Lord, his, his mm -hmm. kindness in, in finding us in our yeah. uh, brokenness and uh, the mess kind of that we were in. Uh, and uh, his love shown to us through a local church family, uh, through Baptist deacons, through a young Baptist pastor. Uh, and uh, you know, our eternity certainly has been changed uh, because of the way the Lord used the church, the way the Lord used those in the church uh, to introduce us to himself. Amen. That's, that's great. Uh, as you were sharing that, I, I thought about in my, our own, my own story. Uh, I had come to know Christ, but uh, I have three younger brothers and I remember a pastor there in my hometown of Wynn knocking on our door. Uh, one of my brothers had inquired about the gospel, and he was 12, and I had a 16-year-old brother who was not saved at the time, and that pastor came in and uh, led both of my uh, the two younger brothers uh, to the Lord uh, at that time. And it really was a defining moment in our family. From that point forward, my parents... Uh, they, they didn't miss church. My dad had, had not really been in church. He worked all the time, but from that point forward, never missed church. He ended up becoming a deacon and serving. Uh, I was 17 at the time, so I didn't grow up with that, but uh, my youngest brother's 12 years younger. He, he grew up like that, and just the faithfulness of those uh, pastors. And a lot of us have pastored that church of 50 and 75 and 100 and you know, you knock on those doors and you share the gospel and, and you know, you see those folks uh, come to Christ uh, along the way. And, and But you never know, uh, you know, there's a, the next Billy Graham, there's the next president of the International Mission Board. And I just think about those churches I was in that I had the privilege going back and pastoring a church that uh, that I was like a teenage boy in that church. And uh, I was that jughead that uh, they probably would never have imagined that, but that's the goodness and the grace of God. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that that part of your story. And why don't, why don't you tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about how you, you know, got into those teen years and, and even beyond. When did you sense that God was uh, calling you to some kind of vocational ministry and and how, how did that play out? How did you answer that call? And uh, I'm sure since you and Michelle were uh, were together since y'all were uh, 13 or 14, that I'm sure that uh, you all probably had conversations about your future together and, and all. So tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. I'd love to. Uh, it certainly wasn't a uh, plan for me uh, to, to be in ministry. In fact, uh, during my high school years, uh, it, it was continuing to go to church, uh, but uh, had it had led a lot of things in my life that shouldn't have been there. And I remember I'd uh, lay my head on my pillow at night, and my prayer was just kind of a rerun every night. Same thing. Uh, I'd confess what I'd done that day. Lord, forgive me. Uh, and uh, then I'd make this promise: someday, uh, when I'm older and it's easier, 
had the fun I want to have. I'll start living for you, Lord. And, and uh, for some reason, I thought that was an appropriate bargain. Uh, that Lord, if you'll forgive me someday, I'll, I'll, I'll start living for you the way I know uh, I should. And that went on for quite a while. Uh, and then there was another dramatic event that also included my two brothers, my, uh, my older brother, my younger brother, my best friend, and myself. Uh, we're bored on a hot August day. Uh, I was 17 years old and younger brother 16. And, and um, we decided to go fishing. And uh, we uh, were in my older brother's car and he was driving on a very curvy road. Uh, back in the mountains, uh, we we're going to pick up a cousin who lived way back in the mountains, and uh, and my older brother was uh, driving. Uh, unfortunately, the way uh, I, I, I drove myself, so I can't fault him here. Uh, just uh, driving a little reckless around the curves there, and and we came around a particular curve, and uh, and uh, there was a one well, of these railroad uh, working crew trucks that was coming the other way. It's uh, just the kind that can run on the tracks or on the highway. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with them, they got the big rig on the front. And, and, uh, the problem was, as we were coming around a curve, we, we had our side in the middle, uh, and, uh, he, he, he didn't look like he was about to budge or could because it happened so quickly. Um, so we were heading towards him and before I could yell, at my brother and say something like you idiot <laughs> get us back over uh he he saw the, the truck and he cut the wheels but it was we were going too fast and and we slid literally right into the path of that truck and and uh, i still when i think about it can hear the, the glass and the metal exploding and we, we it sent us careening spinning around and, and we we slammed into a rock wall back over on our side of the road after the impact, which which was the best of two options, because just off the other side of the road was a, was a cliff that dropped down to the creek, and and uh, wouldn't have survived that drop. But uh, it was a miracle any of us survived the impact. Uh, I, I jumped down to the car immediately and began yelling at people to get out. My brother and my, my friend to get out. I was afraid maybe a catch fire or something, but nobody was moving, and and uh, I went around the other side car just tore all pieces, car parts laying all over the road. And, and my friend was in the back seat down the floorboard, kind of moaning. And my, my older brother was unconscious there, was head against the steering wheel and my younger brother behind him in the back seat, unconscious. I, I thought both of them were, were dead, frankly. And, and uh, yet as I began to yell at them and talk to them, my older brother kind of stirred and, and he was in shock, but he was alive. My younger brother was uh, he, he never responded. Uh, uh, I did what I probably shouldn't have done and dra dragged him out of the car uh, and uh, but uh, hold him up off the pavement, just begging God for his life. And, and uh, the Lord was merciful. You know, there was ambulance rides after that, and helicopter rides and all of that. And he was, uh, everyone was severely injured except myself, internal injuries. Uh, but the Lord spared all of our lives. And, and I remember... In the midst of that time, uh, changing uh, my prayer to God, I wasn't bargaining anymore. Uh, I recognized uh, the Lord could take my life anytime he saw fit. And so I said, Lord, I'll, uh, I'll start living for you the way I know uh, you would have me to and the way I want to now. Uh, and that I've seen uh, how brief my life could be. And just in his kindness and sparing us all and me recommitting my life to him, I soon sensed a call in the ministry that the Lord wanted to use uh, my life in his service. Uh, and I committed to that. Uh, and certainly I look back and think uh, as a, as you said, jughead teenager, a knucklehead, uh, I, I really had it all wrong. I, I thought that the Lord, if I lived for him, would want to cramp my style. And, and yet I can't imagine how my life would be more exciting, more filled with joy and purpose and meaning. And since the day I said, Lord, no more bargaining. My life's yours. I'll live it for you. Uh, and uh, it was uh, through college uh, that uh, the Lord uh, clarified uh, to me, uh, absolutely, I, 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 I want you to serve in ministry. As a seminary student, I began to pastor a church, pastored 18 years before I moved over into uh, missions type work and uh, served with the Kentucky Baptist Convention for about seven or eight years and then came there National Mission Board in 2018. Uh, so that's the journey. And again, yeah. the Lord 
uh, in some pretty dramatic ways it took uh, uh, has grabbed my attention a time or two. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. One of the things that you uh, that you said, I wrote that down, just uh, uh, how your life has been so filled with joy and opportunity and uh, how many of us uh, look back on our life and we could never imagine the opportunities that we've had uh, that God would give us, so many of us, and, and really uh, when we uh, surrender our life to Him and, and trust in Him, we, we could never imagine. I, uh, I look back and, uh, you know, the vehicle by which God has tremendously blessed me, giving me everything pertaining to life and godliness, uh, you know, and, and many times that vehicle has been the blessing of the church uh, uh, in our life. And uh, if uh, you don't mind, just uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, ministry in the church and how uh, you got from uh, being a pastor to uh, an executive director. Uh, you know, I've, I've just been a pastor. Uh, I cannot imagine... Uh, ever being that i can't imagine ever wanting to be that uh but, but uh and, and all and then and certainly uh the big uh, you know i've heard your testimony of of how god called you to be the president of the international mission board and just uh, the the sovereign work of god and how god's prepared you for that but just talk a little bit about you know pastoring for just a little bit and then how uh, that transitioned into executive director and that probably was a you know, in the sovereignty of God, probably a, a way God uh, postured you, Not, and I'm sure he used you effectively there. It wasn't just about posturing you for a future, but uh, in that present, you were certainly serving the Lord. But certainly, uh, God put you in a position where you had a, a, a view that was different and a broader view uh, that prepared you for this new role. Well, it's interesting, and you, you bear testimony to this too, I know, Wes, but, but uh, the Lord's always preparing us uh, for what He has for us, whether it's uh, better preparing us for the way He's going to use us in whatever role we're in, or for another role that He may have planned for us that we may not even uh, have thought of. Uh, but, you know, pastoring a small church prepared you uh, for pastoring the next church God called you to, and ultimately for pastoring a church that the significant an impactful ministry that you have now. And and I saw that uh, happen in my life. I was pastor of small church as a seminary student uh, and um, uh, moved from there as I graduated to a larger church and and uh, from there to a larger church. And, and along the way, began to have uh, more and more connectedness to international missions specifically. Uh, I remember, of course, that little church in the mountains didn't uh, you couldn't see much mission beyond mm. uh, the broken community <laughs> there. Yeah. And and yet, in my first pastorate, I had a, a director of missions, we call them associational mission strategists mm. now, uh, who invited uh, me to, to be a part of uh, an all-mission celebration where we'd have a different missionary speaker in every church in the association every night for about a week. And 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 so I said, well, sure, that sounds fine. And set up kind of like revival services with a missionary speaker. And mm -hmm. and uh, for the first time, I got to meet and hear uh, those uh, missionaries from overseas uh, sharing with us as they were on the furloughs or stateside time. And, and uh, uh, joined us every night. And my heart was just, just uh, captured by what, you know, God was doing, wanted to do among the nations as they shared their stories. Um, then uh, a few years later, I took first mission trip. We had a group of our uh, men in the church who were very active uh, in medical missions, and, and they were taking another trip and asked if I wanted to come along and, 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 and bring a team to do evangelism in the community while they were uh, doing the medical work. And we did that, and Michelle went with me. We had, had a big team. I don't know. There was there was probably close to 30 of us there, went worked in the slums outside of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And, mm -hmm. and God uh, really used that in our lives to open our eyes to uh, those who haven't heard and the great needs uh, of the gospel around the world and how he uses people in that. And uh, all that was sort of coloring uh, my, my, my thinking and my preaching and and, and then, like you, I, I was invited at some point to serve as a trustee on the IMB. Uh, and it came in in 2002 as a new trustee, 
I think I was, I was 32 years old, so I was young and, uh, and, and, and still with a lot to learn. And by being connected to this organization in that role, oh my goodness, it, it, was, it was tremendous education for me. Uh, and my time on the board, again, that, that really colored even more deeply uh, the ministry that I had. I was still pastoring a church, I was also teaching the seminary in Louisville. And so how I was teaching, uh, my classes changed, my sermons, you know, changed with more about God's heart uh, for the nations. And, and uh, uh, you know, fast forward, right after I rolled off the board of trustees uh, in 2010, uh, I was asked uh, the next year if I would consider serving with the state convention as executive director there in Kentucky of the Baptist Convention. I've been very involved in state convention life and, and had different leadership roles just as a pastor, uh, but it, it felt a strong sense of leading to that role. And, and again, with, with the, the, uh, my eyes having been open to the great needs uh, among the nations and to more about what the Great Commission means for a local church, uh, and how cooperative missions, churches working together with other churches can help accomplish uh, the Great Commission. It, that certainly mm -hmm. colored uh, the way I led Kentucky Baptist uh, from 2011 to 2018. Uh, it was a, a, you know, a surprise, I, I, no doubt, uh, when uh, I was uh, asked to serve as International Mission Board uh, president. I'd never been an overseas missionary, been a lot, a lot of, on a lot of mission trips, but never been overseas missionary. Uh, and uh, one of the trustees uh, who was interviewing me uh, through that process uh, asked, uh, you know, what did I think about serving as IMB president and not having been a missionary overseas? And I said, well, I, I think you ought to try to find someone who has been a missionary <laughs> overseas. And uh, Yet, as I did a little research, I discovered that less than half of IMB presidents, we, I'm the 13th in 176 years, less than half of IMB presidents have been overseas missionaries. And, and uh, it's more of a mobilizing uh, uh, work and, and uh, you know, calling churches to support, calling missionaries out than it is, you know, doing frontline work mm -hmm. overseas. And so I've got a leadership team now surrounded with, with, uh, well, if you put the whole group together, over 200 years of experience mm -hmm. overseas. So I've always had that voice in, 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 in my ear. Uh, but as the process moved forward, uh, the Lord called uh, and the board affirmed uh, and Michelle and I uh, accepted the role. And it's just been an incredible privilege. I mean, it's what Southern Baptists have built in terms of a uh, of a missions organization over these 176 years, what we steward today is uh, it's it's overwhelming. It, it it's quite a significant kingdom endeavor, and because of churches like yours and thousands of others across the land, uh, praying, giving, going, sending their missionaries through the IMB, the impact uh, is is incredible. Well, I appreciate that, and I do. Uh, I want to affirm what uh, you said about your team. You have got a great team uh, around you, and uh, the task of the International Mission Board is an impossible task. And as I've heard you say uh, before, in humility, uh, who's qualified to be president of the International Mission Board? Uh, nobody's qualified, but it, God in His grace, He chooses, as He always throughout biblical history and church history, He sovereignly chooses and, and positions people. And I think it's obvious God has prepared you uh, for this. And uh, in the, the people that you have brought on uh, in your tenure, uh, to me, I always notice those things of the leaders that leaders bring around them is probably the greatest testimony to someone's leadership and uh, and all. And so I uh, I certainly want to commend you for that. And uh, we're going to wrap this up. But but I, what I would like for you to do and uh, is to maybe uh, we as a church. And I remember years ago. Uh, I, uh, first mission trip I got to go on, uh, I went with uh, Jerry Rankin and Clyde Metter were on that trip. It was a vision trip to India. It was a 1998 uh, was my first uh, trip and, uh, and all. And, and I remember asking Dr. Rankin about, you know, 
when you look at the churches from your perspective as an international mission board president, what what would you say are those uh, key elements? If you could, uh, and I know all of our churches are different, and uh, and, and 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 that's good. Uh, but what are those things that you would say? Boy, these are things that are, you know, they, these are high capacity, high level uh, churches as far as making an impact on the nations, doing missions in an incredible way. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's some churches that you have in mind that you could maybe pull some things. Well, they do this and they do that, and maybe kind of cast a little bit of a vision for us in us wanting to become. Uh, the church that God wants us to be uh, in in fulfilling the Great Commission. So, so what do you, what what are some things that you might encourage us in, or may you know this scope of this may go out beyond our church, but uh, that you would say, boy, th- these are these are some really uh, high uh, priority qualities of these churches that are really making a difference that we, you know, we love partnering with. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I think about the the vision statement of the IMB, which is really uh, drawn from Scripture. It's a vision of heaven as it will someday be. Uh, where John in Revelation seven nine says, "I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, uh, from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages." Uh, and he goes on to say they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Uh, that vision and, and and awareness of that vision as the reason that the church is still on earth, I think is one is the starting point of, of a church that's really focused uh, and effective in great commission work. It's, it's understanding that God has left us here for a reason. Uh, and that reason uh, goes beyond ministry in our local context, in our community. Uh, surely he's planted uh, churches in a local context in a community, and it's the church's job to do all the church can to reach that community. But it's also the church's job uh, to be faithful to the Great Commission uh, to ensure that the gospel gets to every nation and all the people's tribes and languages of the world, because until that's happened, the vision of heaven hasn't yet been fulfilled. And if until the vision of heaven has been fulfilled, we still have to be here on earth and uh, we have to be on mission, and we have a mission to do, and that mission is clear in Scripture, is to go and make disciples of every nation, every people group uh, in the world. And so, again, I think starting there, a church that recognizes that uh, we really are here for the nations, uh, that's the starting point. From there, you know, the questions come, okay, how can we effectively steward uh, the, the, the resources and the opportunities that God has given to us here in our generation. How can we effectively steward that Revelation 7-9 vision and be be assured that we're doing our part to make that vision come to pass? Uh, For for, uh, us, we we talk about some specific things I've already mentioned, uh, that each church should be very intentional in these areas. And first and foremost, we talk about praying. Uh, What I say often to our missionaries, and they surely recognize it, uh, is that uh, they are not the greatest resource in the Great Commission. It's not mm-hmm. Southern Baptist missionaries or our money mm-hmm. that's the greatest resource in the Great Commission uh, because ultimately uh, we're sending missionaries uh, to and funding missionaries to do what a missionary cannot do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're sending a missionary to go and see people saved. Uh, a missionary has no capacity to save anyone yeah. <laughs> any more than you do or I do, any more than Pastor Allen did when he sat in our living room. It's the Spirit of yeah. God. Mm -hmm. that works through the missionary or through the pastor or through us as individuals. Uh, And so how do we get access to the spirit of God? It is through our prayers. Uh, So the greatest resource that the local church or any individual believer stewards in the great commission is prayer, uh, appealing to the spirit of God to use us, to use our missionaries, to use our church, to reach the nations. That's where it starts. Pray. Uh, then certainly using the resources that God give us, a church that's generous, as your church models generosity, uh, Pastor West, church that's generous, recognizing that God hasn't given us uh, what he's given us to spend on ourselves. And that's true of us individually in our own budgets and lives. It's also true of, of a local church. And, and, and then there's the uh, going part of that. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot uh, recently, we've talked a lot recently in Southern Baptist Life about calling out the call. Uh, and there, in a church the size of your church, uh, I'm, I'm certain that God has a plan to send somebody else to the nations. Uh, and it might be that God's calling a student to go spend a semester or a year overseas. God might be calling a young person to go two years as a journeyman. God might be calling someone to go as a career missionary. God might be calling a retiree to use two or three of their retirement years uh, to, to, to work on a missionary team. You don't have just be a church planter and evangelist. We send doctors and nurses and accountants and farmers and veterinarians. I mean, there's very few jobs that, that uh, don't qualify you uh, for serving overseas. Uh, and then those volunteer mission trips, God might be calling uh, more people to get involved in those as soon as the pandemic had lessons and, and those sort of come back online. There's great and life-changing opportunities there. Uh, and ultimately, all of this is about sending. It's about sending the good news to the nations. Uh, so again, praying, giving, going, and sending uh, a, a church that's intentional in those uh, four things uh, and that is intentional about, you know, connecting well with us at the IMB as we can help equip and facilitate an individual or church in that regard uh, is the kind of church that we love to be in partnership with at the IMB. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's a, that's a great word for us. And, uh, and I do appreciate uh, you sharing your story with us and you casting some vision for us, and uh, I want you to know it's uh, been a, a real privilege for me, even in the midst of COVID, uh, to be uh, an IMB trustee, although about half of that term has been uh, in the midst of that, but, uh, and I'm looking forward to the, the days uh, and the years ahead uh, for the IMB, excited about just coming back from the trustee meeting, 34 new missionaries appointed, and by the way, four of those uh, had Arkansas roots, uh, and got to visit, and three of them were in our affinity, the affinity group that I'm associated with, and did get to reach out to the other uh, one outside that. And so, uh, we're 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 hoping that's going to increase, and that's going to be more and more. And, uh, and and I just want you to know, I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking time uh, to to share with us on this podcast as we cast some vision and get us ready for our global impact celebration. And we look forward to, to you uh, being with us uh, here in just a few days. And we're excited about that. We're praying for it. And we believe God's going to use it as a catalyst uh, in our church where it's not just going to be an event, but it's going to be uh, something that propels us, a launching pad uh, for greater things ahead. And so thanks, Paul, for, for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you in just a few days. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, watching our podcast, uh, uh, Real Talk, as we've been talking about missions these last few weeks, getting ready for our Global Impact Celebration. Let me just encourage you to sign up for all the events that are associated from Wednesday night through Sunday. Uh, get on our website and, and sign up and register for those events. We've got a lot of things going on. We're going to have a lot of missionaries here, a lot of opportunity for you to interact and for God to touch your heart and cast some vision over your life of how you can be engaged in the Great Commission. Uh, God bless you, and thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>